<sighs> you know, there are some days when you realize just how good life can be. And I'm not talking about the warmth of the sun on your face or the gentle morning breeze on your bare skin. I'm talking about the fact that we live in a world where a free cartoon on the internet involving angst and goth wolves and demon on avian intercourse can make me rethink the moral constructs and fallacies of the very nature of heaven and hell, while at the same time paying homage to classic old-timey TV cartoon tropes and making me realize just how good Moxie looks in drag. Oh, and also real life has pizza. That's reason enough to keep living, am I right? When the cherubs were first revealed during the Hell of a Boss Season 1 teaser trailer, I think I know the number one thing that all of us were thinking. Okay, I know the number two thing that all of us were thinking. I... Uh, no, what? Okay, well what I was thinking was that something seemed ever so slightly off about these winged munchkins. I mean, just from aesthetics alone, they look like adorable sugar powder donut babies that I would want to snuggle until their heads pop off, but then I remembered just how subversive Vivzi's takes on heaven and hell have been so far, portraying most demons as morally ambiguous or even reasonable people instead of pure evil, and portraying certain angels as violent killers that slay demons with mercilessness, and possibly even delight. In both of her works so far, we've seen the gradual addition of gray to what's typically portrayed as black and white. And I had a feeling that when this trio was finally revealed, we'd see just what kind of dirt Heaven was hiding under those stainless white robes of theirs. And in the end, we got an episode that did exactly what I wanted, but in a very understated way. Plus, it doesn't come at the cost of the entertainment value one bit. If anything, the entertainment is the most in-your-face and ridiculous it's ever been, with the entire episode giving off the vibes of a classic old-timey cartoon, complete with a little cheesy self-awareness on the side. As a whole, they basically squeeze the most subtle of world-building and character details into the most wacky, insane, and unsubtle of episodes. And while you wrap your head around that, allow me to share the thoughts that I have in mind, as we analyze an episode that may not be amazing, but is definitely a standout of the series so far. Let's check out Hell of a Boss Episode 4, Cherub. Or C-H-E-R-U-B. Whatever you prefer. So the episode starts off with... Well, howdy! I'm Cletus! Welcome to heaven! Okay, I know these guys are bad news and we see their true colors at the end, but... This commercial is just so stinking cute! I mean, look at them! Singing their little songs, making the world happy with hugs, and censoring out all the death with little clouds. Mm, I know you guys don't ask a fee, but I want to donate to your cause! Do you accept cash? Credit? Collateral? Monopoly money? Bitcoin? Baldcoin? Kins cash? Neo points? Piss points? Non-vital organs? Vital organs? Whatever you need, I can give it to you right now! Mm. <sighs> hey, wh where'd all my money go? And where's my liver? So yeah, this episode starts off with the cutest commercial ever, only for Blitz to blow up the TV like we saw in the animatic a while back. At first I thought that Blitz had a vendetta against Cherub for completely stealing his jingle and flipping his business model, but no, apparently shooting TVs that show commercials for other businesses is just a normal pastime for him. So we went from blowing money on TV commercials to blowing money on TVs that play commercials, which he then blows up. There's gotta be a less expensive way to relieve stress, my guy. Also, if that commercial's supposed to be for Heaven's Denizens, how do they get that channel in hell? Does Blitz just have a really good cable provider? Does he get all 777 channels on that thing? Eh, it doesn't matter, because immediately afterwards we get to meet IMP's next client. The eccentric and exuberant loopty goopty Voiced by Brandon Rogers, who also does Blitz. And this is where we first see the element that really makes this episode stand out in my eyes. Maybe it's just me, but this entire episode gave me the vibes of a classic old-time cartoon. Like something out of the Warner Brothers Hanna-Barbera era. Hanna-Barbera? Eh, whatever. I mean, we got the eccentric mustache-twirling jerk who's also super wealthy, the old-fashioned music and film grain during the backstory, the Looney Tunes-style circular background during Wally's commercial, moments of slapstick that give physics the finger, like the pianist gingerly stepping away before his piano gets launched, Blitz and Moxie cross-dressing, which is well-known from Bugs Bunny cartoons, the big climax in the opera house, which could be paying homage to What's Opera Doc or Rhapsody Rabbit, and even a character reminiscent of Betty Boop, who was revolutionary in being one of the first animated sex symbols to ever get big in the industry. So to all the attractive women in adult cartoons nowadays, remember that old Betty walked in heels so you can run in them. Though don't actually do that because running in heels is kind of dangerous. Just put sneakers on or something, that's safer. Heck, even the structure of the episode itself feels very classic. Not much of a complex narrative, just two sides fighting against each other, going from scenario to scenario, location to location, as an excuse to tell jokes. And it works well. 
Throw in the fact that the voice of Lyle Lipton, Michael J. Rocco, was a storyboard artist and voice actor in the current era of Looney Tunes shorts, and you have an episode that really pays homage to the moving drawings of old. Some people might not care as much as I do, but in my opinion, if you ever want to become a professional at a certain craft, especially animation, you need to be familiar and accepting of both old age and modern age techniques. You should study what came before and what came after, so you can have a full picture on how the craft evolved. And when I see modern day cartoons that truly respect their elders and have the classic inspirations running deep through their veins, it just paints a huge smile on my face. And unlike certain other shows, Hell of a Boss isn't owned by Disney. So we don't have to worry about the show being unjustly cancelled right at the peak of its prime because 80 episodes is apparently enough since a show can make way more money through reruns even though they never bothered to rerun the show after it ended, leaving it to decay in an endless void of untapped potential, unanswered questions, and broken dreams. We don't have to worry about that at all! Aside from the cartoony stuff, there's other decent comedy too. I like Lyle's picture of money being a free stock photo. That expositional tour guide was pretty funny. Moxie getting constantly crushed and then no one helping the poor guy. And probably one of the funniest scenes in Hell of a Boss so far, Vivzi herself voicing a dear cherub talking down to the trio after they accidentally kill someone. Vivzi, I hope you don't take offense to this, but you play the smiley, super condescending Walmart supervisor type character so perfectly that it's kind of scary. I hope you do more voice acting in other episodes, because this scene was just golden. However, all that glitters is not gold, because now it's time to talk about this show's version of Heaven. We see very, very little of Heaven itself throughout the episode, but I managed to pick up certain hints from how these little guys interacted. At first, they seem incredibly wholesome and well-meaning. They reprimand IMP occasionally for being jerks, but they seem to be genuinely good in their actions. But then right before the big fight scene, we hear Cletus say, We are saving that shitty sure. old man's life, whether he wants it or not! And there it is. With only one line of dialogue, it's made perfectly clear that these three have absolutely no investment in Lyle's emotional state or well-being, and only care about getting this mission over with as soon as possible. They don't want to see a man's faith restored or a smile of happy realization on a broken soul's face. Nope, they just want to hear the old toad say he doesn't want to croak anymore so they can go home and play Wedding Quake. I understand that IMP was giving them a rough day, and Lyle isn't exactly the most pure of people. Heck, he's basically just Dr. Robotnik with a Mr. Krabs complex. Hello, I like money. But if they really were as selfless and wholesome as they acted, they would see every soul, including one as cruel and sinful as Lyle's, as worth saving. And they dig deep for that small sliver of good that's in everyone, in the hopes that it would improve his life and the lives of others. But here they basically just call him a crotchety old means to an end, not caring about how they convince him to live, and only caring if they get the job done or not. So the big question of the hour is, why even bother? Why open up a non-profit business where you rescue and comfort souls if you don't care about the souls you rescue and comfort? Well, this is where it gets interesting, because when you combine Cherub's behavior with the subtle background details in this episode, as well as the ending scene where the trio gets locked out of heaven, locked out of heaven. it reveals one possible and pretty terrifying truth about this seemingly perfect overworld. Heaven is currently run by nice people instead of good people. Yeah, I don't think I need to explain that nice people and good people are not always synonymous with each other. It is possible to do nice things, but not necessarily be a good person. What really matters is the intention and motivation instead of just the action itself. And judging by how Cherub acts in the beginning versus how they actually are at the end, I'm gonna assume that they, and by extension most of Heaven's denizens, only do their kind deeds for praise and attention. I mean, it does make sense. Take a good look at Heaven for a second. All the gold-plated buildings and harp-shaped mansions and whatnot. The epitome of high-class living, literally. <laughs> Looking at all this, it's pretty safe to assume that every Heaven Denison was born with a silver spoon in their butt, not needing to stress or work a day in their lives because they've been part of this flawless paradise since the very beginning. Throw in the fact that they're powerful, heavenly entities that could do most things with these, and they probably figured, eh, why not? Let's go grace the peasants with our presence and lend them a hand. They'll think we're good people, they'll heap the praise on us, and at the end of the day, we can just go back to laying on our money piles and sipping our 1777 Chateau Bleu Bleu. No risk and all reward. Heck, the Cherub commercial on its own just reeks of self-promotion through good deeds. Well howdy everybody, we just wanted to show you a clip show to remind you that we're all selfless souls that help all kinds of people in need. We do all the heavy lifting, even though we're all powerful heavenly entities with super strength that won't even break a sweat anyway, we don't even ask a fee, even though we're pretty much set for life and we have all the kickbacks back home so we don't really need the money, aren't we all such nice people? 
Yeah, right. You got a solid gold toilet I can puke into? So yeah, in the same way that hell is a breeding ground for drug-addicted criminals, heaven seems like it could be a breeding ground for entitled, self-serving jerks, whose only real care in the world is that their perfect paradise stays as perfect as it's always been. This could explain their hatred for demons as well, seeing them as one big corrupted lower class, instead of a bunch of individuals that all deserve to be judged on their own. I mean, if you listen to Kenny's rant about demons, she uses the phrase, your kind, meaning she pretty much lumps all of hell's denizens into one uniform group. It's your typical privileged rich person mindset. All people in the lower class are criminal scum that deserve to be ridiculed no matter what. No one that comes out of that fiery cesspit could possibly be a good person. Obviously, we as an audience have seen that most demons actually have small hints of good, which could blossom if properly tended to. And there are even some demons that are just straight up good people. But Heaven already has their predetermined image of what all demons are and ever will be, and they're too busy to look down from their million dollar mansions to notice anything else. Heck, if we look at the Vivzy deer scene, it seems like Heaven's residents have gotten so selfish throughout the years that they don't even care about each other anymore. I mean, after Cherub accidentally kills someone, it's a complete done deal. No one cares that it was just an accident, no one lets them explain themselves or seek redemption, no one even bothers to explain why they can't come into heaven. For all we know, the reason is probably, yeah, you know, if we let three murderers into heaven, then we gotta make exceptions for other murderers, which means we gotta accept other criminals, which means we gotta accept all kinds of lower class scum, and I don't want them leaving cigarette ashes and blood stains on my spotless gold driveway. No, 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 no. Okay, bye bye but now comes the biggest question of all. Has Heaven always been this way? I don't think so. I want to guess that back in the day, Heaven was just as wholesome and giving as everyone thinks it would be. And God, who is a thing in this show, was the guiding hand who showed the light to all his Heaven-born creations while also keeping an eye on his children down on Earth. But as time goes by, Earth gets more and more populated, more and more things down there require God's attention, and eventually God needs to spend 100% of his time looking after Earth. This means that he can't guide his creations in heaven anymore, so he trusts them to carry on his legacy in his absence. Do as I've taught you, spread my gospel, I'm counting on you. But after a while, heaven devolved into the disaster it is right now. The angels probably realized that they live in paradise, so why even bother doing good deeds if they're already loaded? Some people kept doing good deeds just to be praised as nice people, like the cherubs, everyone started seeing all demons as just criminally scummy lower class that could never be saved, and it's even possible that some people twisted God's word to fit their own self-serving agenda. Look at this poster in the background. Surround yourself with people that will lift you up, so ditch your loser friends who you can use. Signed, God. I want to bet that the top portion is something that God actually said as a teaching, while the bottom part is something that heaven denizens assumed, or even just made up to justify their behavior. Like, it's okay guys, be as rich and spoiled as you want. If someone or something can't be useful to you, just get rid of it. Even God said it's okay, so what's stopping us? And then they started preaching things like this to future generations. If I'm actually correct about all this, then that means that the angels turned heaven into a literal gated community behind God's back. That is the most messed up thing I've ever heard, and I love it. It's times like this where I'm actually glad that Has Been Hotel hasn't come out yet. Small reveals like this show that Charlie's mission is going to be hitting some major roadblocks as it goes through. If Heaven is really as privileged and dismissive as they seem to be here, it's possible that they'll never accept demons on their doorstep, no matter how reformed they may be. They'll feel like they already had their chance, and they're not going to give them a second one there, and this could lead to some fantastic storytelling and drama if that's what they're going for. Seeing Charlie and all the demons she reformed fighting by her side as Heaven keeps pushing them back. Maybe Charlie will go to Heaven herself, and actually meet face to face with the disheveled and overworked God. She'll reveal to him what Heaven has become without his guidance, and maybe they'll work together to completely retool the broken Heaven and Hell system, allowing demons to be redeemed and even angels to be punished. And she alone could be responsible for giving this poor guy some much needed rest and emotional comfort after all he's been doing to help others. You know what? I'm gonna say it. I want to see Charlie hug God. I want to see the princess of the underworld who everyone doubted giving emotional comfort to God in his biggest time of need. The rulers of heaven and hell meeting on an adorable common ground. That, that's it. That's what I want. In fact, when this video goes up, I'm gonna put that in the hashtags. No other video is ever gonna use it, but I don't care. I want it. Anyway, the point is that Hell of a Boss is indirectly hyping me up for Has Been Hotel while still being awesome on its own. And that is a big accomplishment. 
And if you could care less about has been, Heaven might also provide some interesting stories for Helleva as Welleva. I talked a lot about the subtle details in this episode, and one of the main things I paid attention to during my third or fourth rewatch is actually the blue sheep cherub, Colin. And let me just say, this guy's co-workers really put him through a lot. Forcing him to do all the paperwork, throwing him into the path of hungry wolves, slamming him around when he accidentally says OMG, and when you combine all of this with his more timid way of speaking, and even the scared look that he gives Cletus when he freaks out, I want to guess that this poor boy is kind of like the doormat of the Cherub Trio, being forced to do most of the work for the company because he's either too scared to stand up for himself, or maybe he's actually a decent guy deep down who wants to help. Colin's treatment not only shows again that cherubs really don't give a darn about each other, but it gives me some hope for his character later on. With the trio now banished from heaven, maybe they'll split up and Colin will start to have a change of heart. Maybe he'll meet up with Moxie again while he's on a mission, and after they talk, he'll start to see that demons can actually be reasonable people when you treat them like people. I know I probably talked way too much about heaven in this video, but it really does give me a ton to think about, both for the present and the future. As for problems, I will admit that this isn't really the funniest episode so far. Normally that's not a big problem like with Lululand, but considering that this episode was going for pure comedy without any emotion or character beats, I was hoping for a lot more laughs than we got. Also, there were a couple of plot things that really bugged me. I mean, this whole situation was started because of an age-reversing machine, so why didn't Lyle just throw the switch and revert back to his younger self? I mean, we don't see the machine exploding or the government shutting it down or whatever, so why not just use the machine again, but this time with someone to monitor it? I also thought that weird snake oil style inventor guy was 100% pointless. He literally only existed to give Lyle and Loopty some employment at the end of the episode. I thought it would have been nicer if it just ended with the two friends being reunited. That's all you really need. Finish the episode on an emotional high note. Or mid note, I guess. And lastly, how exactly did Lyle and Lupti turn into cyborgs when they entered Hell? Yeah, instead of just becoming traditional demons like Mrs. Mayberry, we got Lupti turning into Doc Ock and Lyle turning into Big Weld for some reason. I mean, it's implied that they met up with Blitz only moments after they died, so they couldn't have built this stuff in that short of a time. Maybe Hell just has a sick sense of humor? Like the murderous robotic scientists are now murderous robots themselves, and the gangster who couldn't keep his hands to himself now has more of them? Heck, Lyle has piano key teeth and it was a piano that ultimately killed him. I don't know, maybe I'll make a theory about this. So, is Cherub my new favorite episode of the show? Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, not even close. Lululand is still a firm lock for number one. But credit words do, this episode still does its job well. I love all the old-fashioned cartoony tropes they used, the designs for the scientists and the cherubs were awesome, a good amount of the jokes worked, and if I was reading the room correctly, Heaven is going to be an interesting beast to deal with, both in Helleva and Hasbin. I'd say that this one is currently tied with Spring Broken for my number 3 spot, because Spring Broken was a lot funnier but had some major plot issues, while Cherub was less funny but a lot more interesting. So far, Hell of a Boss has truly been a roulette wheel of enjoyment. You never really know what you're going to get from an episode. Sometimes you might cry your eyes out, sometimes you might ponder about a character's past, and sometimes you might realize that Millie as a blonde is freaking adorable. No matter what though, this show has been a consistent good time for me. And as always, if you haven't checked it out already, definitely do so. Because by golly, by golly, by golly, you never know the truly wonderful wonders of Vizzy Pop until you try it for yourself. Gotta be vitamins in there somewhere. <laughs>